Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us for uh, webinar two in this series, which is all around um, an introduction to uh, bridge assessments and also the relationship of that to um, the access decision making role that, that many of you have in, in local governments. So thanks for joining us today. This webinar will focus on basic vehicle and bridge interactions. OK, so just as a bit of a reminder, um, you'll see on the screen there the list of webinars um, one to eight. We had session one um, on Tuesday of this week um, and that video, if you weren't able to make that particular one, will be made available to you. Um, and as I say, today we'll be fo focusing on basic vehicle and bridge interactions. So just quick introductions. So uh, just quick well, introduction. my name. Um, I'm the project manager for the Strategic Local Government Asset Assessment Project here at the NHVR. Um, and with me today, uh, Dr. Neil Lake. Neil will be um, pretty much running today's session. So um, uh, I'll get Neil when he gets to his next slide, which I think one or two slides time, um, just to give a bit more of an introduction. So uh, yeah, just a quick, in terms of today's webinar, a quick welcome from myself, and then we'll get into, I guess, the uh, the main reason for this webinar is just to explore the basic vehicle and bridge interactions, which is a bit of an introduction here, but some very good fundamental information that Neil will be providing to you in that time. So uh, following that, we'll have a, a small amount of time for questions and answers. Um, and we'll try to address those in that remaining time. What I might ask you to do is um, if you can put your questions as we go, because you'll probably think of things along the way. So rather than actually asking the question at the time, maybe just put them into the chat and then we can um, have a listen to uh, try and address them at the end of the session. Um, if you haven't already, please mute your microphones so that we don't get any feedback coming through. Um, now, you're probably aware that the session is being record, recorded and the main reason for that is to make that available after the session um, to either re-watch or for others who, who weren't able to attend. And we will be sending that out to you along with the slides. So the other thing is here, um, as I said, we've got a series of eight webinars. It's important that you watch them in order because the content builds through each of those webinars. So um, if you haven't had a chance, go back and watch the first one and then uh, go from there. So that way it'll help build your knowledge um, through the series. Um, and just a quick reminder, um, as I said in the first webinar, we talked a bit about what the project is about. Um, so rather than going back over that today, what I'm gonna do is just direct you to our uh, project website, which you can see here on the screen. Uh, we've set this up um, in the engagement hub, tell you everything about the project, jump in if you haven't already, jump in there and register. You'll get access to a whole heap of information, as you'll see on the left-hand side of the screen there, uh, the Road Manager Toolkit, which is a really, really important resource that we're building in this space. And obviously these webinars are a part of that information, along with some other tools and resources that we're currently developing and will continue to do throughout, throughout the program. All right, so that's about it from me. I'll now uh, hand over to Dr. Neil Lake. <laughs> Great, thanks very much, uh, Todd. Uh, for those of you who went on the first webinar and don't know who who I am, my uh, um, I, I work for the Institute of Public Works in uh, Queensland, and uh, my background has been in this uh, heavy vehicle access and bridge assessment space uh, um, over the last ten or fifteen years. Uh, lots of involvement with lost roads and lots of involvement with councils trying to help them with their their decision making around heavy vehicle access. So. Uh, I just want to welcome you today to this uh, to the session, and I hope that you'll get uh, a lot out of it. Um, as Todd indicated before, um, there there are um, that I'm running through a series of uh, about four webinars over, so this one and then three more, which are all really focused on trying to get our our understanding to a level where we can really. Uh, make, uh, you know, have the fundamentals to make good access decisions. And uh, before we can get into that point of using things like tier one assessment, uh, understanding how uh, assessment frameworks go together, that sort of thing, 
the first starting point that I'd like you take to take you through is really trying to get a basic understanding of what the critical elements are that really point to whether these sorts of processes uh, are appropriate and valid and what we have to think about. Um, you know, how do we compare, you know, what we might have done in the past to new access requests. So there's these range of fundamentals that we need to understand. And these are the key things that I want to try and focus on today. Now, my intention today is, is not to get so deep into the nitty gritty, but we want to just collate enough information that we can start to, to know that things matter um, and, and know the basic principles of, of why they matter. So the key things that I really want to want everyone to get out of today is understand the importance of concentration of mass of vehicles, understand how bridge configurations actually affect um, uh, where we end up. Uh, sorry, how bridge configurations affect, um, you know, how how vehicles load structures, the impacts of live load factors. I want to talk about the dynamic load in interaction uh, with the bridge and how that affects the loads and just also the impact of vehicle position, the ground contact width, that's what GCW stands for, um, and the bridge type and how that affects the sharing of loads across the, uh, the structure. Now, I, I just wanted to just touch on a, a little point here. Um, I'm hearing a bit of noise coming through. Um, there, there obviously is some people that have their uh, microphones not on mute. So if I could ask you just to, um, just to mute your microphones, just so that we don't have any background noise coming through for everyone. That would be uh, that would be much appreciated. All right, so let's get uh, stuck into it. We've got a, a fair bit to get through, but um, and and obviously, if you have any questions as you, as you go along, um, please just uh, whack them in the chat, or you know we can have a, a chance to um, to discuss some things uh, at the end as well. Um, all right, so let's start with load magnitude and concentration, and and I'd pose this, um, you know fairly um, well what could be thought of as a straightforward question but which one of these vehicles um, is worse which one creates a higher impact on the structure so have, have a good think about that because the answer is not always as obvious to some people it's obvious but really it's very contextually specific um, whether one of them is worse than another so Let's uh, let's ponder that question again. So you, hopefully in your mind, you'll have an idea of which one you think is worse at the moment for, a, say, a bridge. Um, but I would like you now to consider that question now that we understand what our bridge looks like. So which one of these is worse now? And, and I think from when we look at this, clearly we can see that, you know, that road train, not all of that, uh, not all of that vehicle is going to um, load that structure at one time. Now, to understand which one's worse in this case, again, it's not so straightforward because while we have the middle vehicle, there is a shorter vehicle with less axles. Um, it's also loaded to HML, which has higher loads on the individual axles. For instance, the try on that particular vehicle uh, would be loaded to 22 and a half tons, whereas the, the truck and dog below, the try would only be loaded to 20 tons. And so, it's not completely clear cut which one would be worse because one has a little bit higher concentration of mass, one's a bit longer and weighs more. So the answer to that question is, is a little bit tricky and not something you can just look at. And certainly it's pretty obvious from this example that we can't rely on uh, gross vehicle mass. You say, how much load could this bridge take? Well, 118 tonnes, yeah, maybe it could take it, but you know, maybe the 33 tonne one might be more critical, right? So gross vehicle mass is not a good measure of the capability of a bridge. And that's one of the real key fundamental points that I, I want to get across. And, and this is important when we say load limit structures. You know, we say the load limit of this structure is, you know, 42 tonnes or, or is 15 tonnes. But what is 15 tonnes? I think that's an important uh, question to answer. Um, and I would suggest that it's not necessarily always the gross vehicle mass, something to keep in mind. But of course, we can extend this example a little bit more, right? Which, which vehicle is worse now? And I think that most people would agree that the top vehicle is really starting to become pretty critical in this situation. So the important point here is that the context matters and there are a number of parameters that really matter. 
But we take that again to another extreme. Here we've got a very small culvert. So which vehicle is worse in this case? Uh, clearly, we can barely even get triaxles across this particular culvert. So perhaps, you know, a dual axle might be more critical or often is the case with these things. It's the single heavy axle that can be most critical because what we find on a lot of our uh, vehicles is that, you know, when we have um, loads in larger groups of axles, the load per individual axle is often a little bit lower. Uh, and then as we get down to dual axle and single axles, the load per axle actually goes up. So in this case, uh, you know, I, I can't really tell you exactly what's going to be critical here, but it's quite likely to be this HML vehicle. Um, but again, you know, we don't have a dual axle on, on that one. We've got some steer axles. Maybe the steer axle governs. I don't really know. I'd need to look at the specifics. And I think that's the important point that we want to make here. So some of the critical parameters that we need to associate uh, with when we try and understand the impacts that a vehicle would have on a structure. The gross vehicle mass can be critical, particularly when the structures are longer, but it's the distribution of mass that's particularly critical. And it's critical as it relates to the context of the bridge span, how long the span is. So in any way that we're in, in, in any measure that we're trying to actually start to understand how a vehicle loads a bridge and, and how we can make good access decisions, there's a couple of things that we need to think about. Obviously, the axle loadings, also, though, the axle spacing. So we're talking about the concentration of mass. But we're also interested in the bridge configuration, right? So we've just gone through a little exercise there where we really start to understand how important that span is in that situation. But also there's something else called continuity, which I'm going to cover in the next slide that's also important. Now, something we'll cover a bit later on, also the ground contact width. So that's how wide a vehicle is. Um, and where that vehicle sits in the transversely across the structure, so across the structure, not along, not in the direction of travel, but across the deck. That's also very important in how vehicles load structures, and we'll talk a little bit of that, about that as we go along. So let's talk about bridge configuration, and I want to cover this uh, particular aspect of um, uh, whether the structure or the, the, the continuity of the structure. And so we're going to talk about two key things here, and that is simply supported uh, structures and continuous structures. So if we look at this example on the right here, we can see that the deck or the superstructure in this case, you can see how that travels all the way through that internal pier. And so the deck is continuous, right? So that's what we mean by a continuous structure. And what happens in continuous structures is that um, the deck actually, the deck and the girders actually will bend over that middle support. And what that does is allows an opportunity for what we call bending moment to develop in, in over the top of the pier in that superstructure. And uh, what that means is that, you know, we can actually put reinforcement into that top section and actually uh, resist that bending moment. Um, and what that does is that it actually evens out the moments across the structure so that, you know, you can you have a little bit less in the middle of the spans, but uh, some of that is taken over the actual peer support. And we can see uh, in the very bottom diagram, we've got what's called, a, in this instance, it's a bending moment diagram. And we can see that, you know, in the middle, that, that structure's sagging down, and so we had bending moments where we need to be able to take what's tension in the bottom, um, and so we use steel reinforcement to do that. But in the case of a continuous structure, you also need to have steel in the top of the superstructure to um, withstand those hogging moments. So that's so that's what our continuous structure is, and, and we will have instances of these out in our bridge stocks, right? So it is something that we need to be aware of um, because this also impacts how uh, vehicles you know, load the structure. And it becomes particularly important uh, what parts of the vehicles are in different spans on continuous structures. So the alternative to that, and uh, the most common uh, sort of structure that we have is something called a simply supported structure. Now, in this case, you can see the red line there. That's where um, there is no continuity between those uh, superstructure elements. So the, the deck um, is separate 
and Beck and Girders are separate in those two spans. And what that means is that we don't have continuity over that particular peer, and uh, so we don't have bending moment over it. So our bending moments change, and we just have this um, sagging in the middle of the, um, you know, the span where there, and there's no moment over the peer superstructure. This is the most common um, type of bridge that we see uh, in in Australia because of its simplicity um, and and ease of of installation. All right, so so that covers a bit of bit of the basics about how vehicles actually load structures. Now I want to talk a little bit about live load factors. Now, uh, it's interesting with live load factors because I hear a lot of people referring to them, um, you know, making uh, statements like, you know, oh, we've got a live load factor because there's another vehicle next to the vehicle. You know, there's more than one vehicle on the bridge. And I, and I just want to really clearly dispel that idea. All that uh, a live load factor is designed to do is um, increase um, the, the base load that we think a vehicle is going to be by uh, an amount, a ratio, to account for the chance that that vehicle might be overloaded. And so basically, um, you know, in many situations, we, you know, we would double the load that we think a vehicle is to account for the chance that, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, something has happened, meaning that that load is much higher than what we think it uh, is meant to be. Now, that live load factor should make that total load be equivalent to a 0.5 chance of occurring in 100 years. That's what our uh, Australian design code um, uh, suggests that that live load should cover. So that, you know, if we have a vehicle that's meant to be 40 tonnes, um, about every 2,000 years on average, a vehicle that's meant to be 40 tonnes would actually be, if the overload factor was two, would actually be 80 tonnes. Right? So that's what the overload factor is designed to do. And it's all about the statistics of overload and the chance of it occurring. Um, the one point that I would make in uh, around this particular issue is that, you know, those live load factors, they can be calibrated. So you can go out and measure the loads that are traveling around a network and you can actually um, calibrate the statistics so that, you know, you change the, the, the live load factor to make sure it's equivalent to that 0.5 chance of occurring in 100 years. And, and I just wanted to make the comment that while we have factors in our codes, they've never actually been calibrated. There's been some work done around this, but there hasn't actually been that calibration exercise. Um, done to date um, that you can go and read about. Now, I think so. So the co provisions they they do provide information on live load factors, but I I think that it's important that we don't necessarily see them as fixed. So what a live load factor is designed to do is make sure that we've got some safety when we don't have a great control over what we think the load could be. And so, and we see that in our design codes, which I'll come to with different factors for different types of vehicles. But, but one of the things is that the codes are not comprehensive. And I think that what we should be thinking about with live load factors is that if we can find ways to open up dialogues with operators to improve compliance, to ensure that you know, the chance of overloading is lower or it's more controlled, in other words, we're controlling the risk, then perhaps we should not necessarily think of load factors as being just fixed. That's what the code says. Um, acknowledging again that, that, uh, that, you know, load factors haven't been calibrated in Australia. So something to be aware of. So let's talk about uh, the Australian standard. This is the bridge standard, AS5100 part seven, um, which is uh, the part that's all about um, uh, assessing structures and, and evaluating, uh, you know, uh, I guess evaluating heavy vehicle access. Now the load factors that it suggests at the moment, um, for normal traffic, it's suggesting that a load factor of two would apply. And uh, if we go to some more specific vehicles like cranes or volumetric loading, 
some of those load factors can come down to more like 1.6. Now I've put a little but there, volumetric 1.6, but I would encourage you when you're thinking about what is an appropriate load factor for a volumetric load, perhaps it's worth thinking about, well, how heavy can we actually overload a volumetric situation? So, so let's say we had a cane vehicle um, that was uh, transporting cane to a mill, you know, how based on its um, geometry, how heavy could that actually be? And this is something perhaps you could open up a, a dialogue with with operators about. So, for instance, you know, um, you know, if you if you uh, get the cane and, it, and it's uh, just about falling up over the top and it's been raining and so it's all wet, well, how heavy could that be? And perhaps those load factors, you know, might need to account for that. So it's something to think about that the code just doesn't automatically tell you what the right answer is, so to speak. But it's there as a, a guide. So road trains and B doubles in the code, they, they do have some provision for IAP and onboard mass. So, you know, these provisions are designed to help um, control um, the potential for overloading. And so it allows a, a lower factor, 1.8. But, you know, I guess the question that we always need to be asking is, well, does it actually make a difference to that compliance? Um, and, and obviously issues of data and data access become involved in that. And these are things that perhaps you can open up, open up dialogues about um, if we're trying to optimise access on a network. Again, uh, heavy load platforms, they talk about 1.5, but you know, what is a heavy load platform? I mean, we can come up with a definition, but you know, is a live load, a, a low loader, considered a heavy load platform. So there's a there's a fair bit of gap in, in the codes in terms of what oversize over mass um, load factors would potentially be. And the reason why I talk about this is because, you know, if you go out to a supplier to get an assessment done, every supplier will come back with a different load factor. And so I think it's important uh, as uh, asset owners that we start to, to start to think about, well, what are appropriate live load factors um, and, and the key to that question is how well do we actually know the spread uh, of the potential masses, right? So how much certainty do we have? Um, so obviously compliance is, is pretty critical here and, and could guide our assumptions. And, and perhaps, you know, in many situations you'll need specialist knowledge about it, but it's something to be aware of. Um, so who decides a live load factor? Well, essentially, uh, the, the road manager is the person who's responsible for deciding that. Um, it's their asset. Um, they're the ones who can decide what the parameters are. Obviously, there is guidance in the codes. Um, and obviously, you could get guidance from a supplier or a consultant. But ultimately, this is, this is in the road manager's domain. So also within the standard, uh, there are also live load factors for design, historical design vehicles. Um, I, I just put this up there just for a bit of uh, general knowledge, but I think there's a couple of important points is that this code does allow you to consider a live load factor for older vehicles. Um, and why that's important, and, and we'll, we'll probably get to this in later webinars, but um, it is important because, you know, those older vehicles were back in a time where our um, uh, evaluation methodologies, our analysis methodologies were quite different. Uh, we sort of had a pseudo working stress design back in those eras, uh, pre, uh, probably pre-92 uh, when we started to go to limit state design. So it's important just to see that those load factors can be used uh, in there um, so that when we're crossing different code eras, uh, there is still a way forward. The other thing I'd just point out too is that there is a um, uh, the the wheel load there, the W80 axle load 160 and the SM1600, they're our current standard in-lane design vehicles at the moment. And the load factor for them is 1.8. And, uh, you know, these are fictitious vehicles. They have a uniform load component. They've got an axle uh, load component. And the point that I want to make is that if you got a vehicle, let's say that you had uh, a, a moving 1600 load that's applied for access, right? Now it's not a real vehicle, so it can't happen, but if you had something that was similar, what's interesting is when it's designed versus when it's evaluated, uh, potentially we could have lost uh, sort of 20% there. We could go from um, 
uh, oh, sorry, 10%. We can go from a factor of 1.8, but then as soon as we evaluate a real vehicle that looks like it, suddenly our load factor is probably more like two. So it's just something to watch out for. Just because a vehicle has, uh, bridge has been designed for a particular vehicle doesn't mean that that automatically passes in an evaluation setting. So just something to be a little bit aware of. So the next thing, the next key um, thing that I wanted to talk about was a thing called dynamic load allowance. Now, what dynamic load allowance is all about is that it accounts for when a vehicle crosses a structure, uh, it's a dynamic uh, set of loads and those loads can interact with the structure itself to cause an amplification of the load effect. Right. So uh, basically, if a vehicle drove across um, very slowly, the load would be considered being applied in a static way. And then if we then drive that vehicle across the bridge at speed, any change in the response of the bridge would be uh, accounted for with a dynamic load allowance. So for instance, if 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 a uh, particular girder experienced a moment of a hundred, uh, sorry, a hundred kilometers in uh, when it, when it was at speed, uh, when it was going slowly, so a static, and then uh, at speed, that same girder experienced a bending moment of 150 kilometers. Well, then we've had a 50 percent increase in the load due to the dynamic response of the bridge. And so, you know, we would have a dynamic load allowance of, you know, 50% extra or 1.5 would be the factor that we would apply to our static loads. Now, this is, uh, this is quite uh, in, important because, you know, it can be fairly sizable, uh, the increase. You know, in most situations, we're talking about somewhere between a 20 to a 50% increase in load. Now, currently the code um, in terms of evaluation just has a pretty standard set response of 1.4 uh, as the dynamic load allowance. Um, and so whatever our static loads are, we increase them by 40%. Uh, that's, that's what happens now. There is some provision in the code for reducing that to 1.3 if you've got a very smooth road profile. And the reason why a smooth road profile makes a difference is that that dynamic interaction between the vehicle and the bridge is really quite dependent on, for lack of a, a, a better description, how much the vehicle bounces across the bridge. And so, you know, particularly in short and medium span bridges, how much the triaxle bounces as it crosses the bridge has a big impact on the dynamic load allowance. As we get to longer spans, how much the whole vehicle bounces becomes critical. And it's the interaction of that bouncing frequency and the bridge frequency that actually impacts how much the dynamic load allowance ends up being. Now, uh, some important points historically in a lot of codes, it's been lower than 1.4. So that can impact the uh, evaluation results that you get from uh, any assessment that's done. Now, so the things that really affect those things are the bridge dynamic response, so that's how stiff it is, uh, what the geometry is, the vehicle dynamic response, so that's how heavy the vehicle is, what suspension it is, uh, what geometry, what speed, all those sorts of things, the interaction of those effects, um, and then of course, as I said, the road profile. Now, What's important to understand with this whole dynamic load allowance is that a lot of people think that we can just go out and measure the dynamic load allowance. And I've seen many you know, requests for quotes to go out for a council and measure all of the dynamic uh, you know, load allowance responses for all of their structures. And, and I guess having been someone that's been involved in the measurement of, I don't know, perhaps you know, 60 or more bridges, uh, looking specifically at, at dynamic load allowance and the response of bridges uh, to to loads, I, I I would encourage you perhaps that that's not the best and most appropriate use um, of your dollars in terms of trying to uh, get better outcomes. Now, a couple of key reasons for that. Um, 
One is, is that any dynamic load uh, test that's done is usually done at service loads, right? So we haven't used that, um, that live load factor. We're not doubling the load when we do these tests. And so any results that you get at service level, um, then, you know, potentially you would apply at an ultimate level. So, you know, a doubly overloaded situation. And uh, I think that there is an evidence that those two correlate. And, and I think that actually what happens is that often at a service level, um, our responses are actually much worse. Our dynamic load allowance or, you know, our dynamic response is higher. And if you add in a bit of a depression at the start of the structure, you know, certainly uh, it was a common saying that we had while we were doing these tests, you could get 50% out of any structure at service, um, particularly the, in that median to short span range, um, if you just had a big enough bump. And so that presents a very significant problem because if you go out and you do your uh, dynamic load testing and you end up with a high result, you know that it's probably not applicable at the higher load um, and you can't unknow what you now know. So you, you end up in a situation where you're a bit damned with, with what you've come up with. If you end up recording a, 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 a dynamic load allowance of, of 0.5, well, suddenly you, you're almost committed to using that, even though once you get it to the ultimate load, it's, it's, it's generally thought that the dynamic response would reduce as the loads get heavier. There's been a very small amount of work done in that particular area, um, but very limited, and there's certainly been no um, actual um, tests done with load at that level for obvious reasons, because we're up at the failure zone, you know, potentially of, of a structure. So um, it's very difficult. So, you know, I think that the one thing that we can do in terms of dynamic load allowance, you know, we, we can get some benefit out of, um, you know, uh, having smooth road profiles that's covered in the code. I think that's worthwhile. Um, and, and obviously going slower is worthwhile, but I'd have to say that that speed is not, you know, I will change the speed from 80 to 60 because in many structures that actually makes the dynamic uh, uh, load amplification worse. Um, so there's going to be a sweet spot somewhere in, in there to do with vehicle speed. And that's when, you know, the sort of the way that the vehicle vibrates or bounces is uh, starting to match the structure. And speed is obviously very important in that process. And so, you know, that amplification could be worse anywhere between 40 to 100. And, and often what we find is the faster you go, the less it is. And the much slower you go, the less it is. But, you know, in the middle, it can be quite, quite varied. And so, you know, if we are talking about controlling the dynamic load allowance with speed, those speeds need to be very low. You know, we're talking about 10 and 20 kilometres an hour, not just reducing the speed from, you know, uh, 100 down to 60. You might make the situation worse. All right, uh, let's talk about multiple presence for a minute. So, you know, obviously when we had most structures, you know, we had multiple lanes um, on a bridge and What's important is that, you know, when we use things like live load factors to really factor up the uh, the magnitude of load on a particular vehicle, well, you can't apply that same, you know, doubly overloaded vehicle with a live load factor in the other lane. Because if we, if we double both of them, then we're actually getting to a point where the probabilities of that load are going to be much, much higher than, you know, a one in 2,000 year return interval. So the way that the codes generally allow for this is we have something called an associated lane factor. So what that means is that while our first vehicle we set currently at one, so it's one times the dynamic load allowance times the live load factor, when we put a vehicle next to it, we actually reduce the size of that load to account for the fact that the chance of two really, really completely overloaded vehicles is going to be being next to each other is going to be lower. And so the second vehicle gets a reduction. And then if we have multiple lanes after that, then they also get a reduction. It reduces down to say 0.4. Now, um, it's very important that when we do as assessments is that we do consider the fact that, that we can have multiple vehicles on a structure at one time. So if we look at there over uh, on the right hand side, we can see that, you know, the, the left hand vehicle 
that I, I've have in that diagram. It, it has a set of loads that go into the girders as per the first profile that you can see below the deck. And then the right hand one has a different profile, but you can see that the right hand uh, vehicle also loads the extreme left hand girder, but only a small amount. Uh, and so we have to um, add those distributions to get to see what the overall effect uh, is across all of the girders on the structure. So that's why it is very important. I, I would also make the point that how much load gets transferred across those girders is very, very dependent on the bridge type. So things like, say, timber girder bridges, we don't get so much transfer load across the deck. Um, but whereas structures like something like a deck unit or a slab slab bridge or um, those sorts of things, then you get a very strong transfer load of cross and you get a more even uh, distribution of loads in each of the girders. And that's really important to be thinking about uh, as we move forward. Now, uh, I was going to make the comment that associated lane factors, um, while they're set in the code at 1.8 and 0.4, and and please note that these have historically been different over time. In the work, real world, how big that factor should be is very dependent on the traffic volume. And I, I would make the comment, I've done some work around this in terms of simulating, uh, you know, uh, having vehicles next to it and, and uh, you know, with traffic volume. And, and what that work found is that actually our approaches are reasonably conservative at the moment, right? So I'm not going to say uh, by how much, because it is very dependent on traffic volume. But once you get to very low traffic volumes, there is a case for those factors to be reduced. Now, I don't say that because you need to be thinking about reducing them or anything like that. I say that just to be aware of that fact. Um, because all these little bits of information actually do impact our decision making, I think, over time. Right, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about transverse distribution of load. I touched on it in the other slide. Now, what transverse dis distribution of load means is that how loads get shared between girders, right? So we, we talked about that before in, in the previous slide. And uh, let's look at this example here on the right hand side. So let's say that we had two 50 ton trucks um, there. And then, so we, we, you know, and let's say that we know that the structure can take those two 50 ton trucks. Well, if then we have an oversized over mass vehicle that's also crossing this, that wants to cross the structure, can we say, well, because two 50 ton trucks can go, then the 100 truck ton, 100 ton truck could go. And so that's the question that I just want you to ponder at the moment. Uh, can the case on the left be compared to the case on the right without considering the transverse distribution of load? There are some other things that we also need to think about that we covered in the, the earlier slides. That being how long the span is obviously matters, what the configuration of the vehicle is, so how much load can fit on a span. All of that really matters, um, but we won't go too into depth on that particular issue. What about live load factor, dynamic load allowance and associated lane factors? All of these also impact whether this comparison could be made. The one on the left, the live load factors would be two. The one on the right, the live load factors might be something more like one and a half. On the left, the dynamic load allowance would be 1.4. On the right, the dynamic load allowance, if the vehicle was traveling slowly, could be as low as 10% as, uh, as 1.1. Obviously, there's no associated load factor on the one on the right and the one on the left, there would be some. So the second vehicle would get reduced by, say, 80 percent in that case. So it's not easy just to compare apples to apples. So if we start now looking at the distribution of how loads might transfer into each of those elements, what, what I have in these two diagrams is, say, again, we could be looking at any particular action, but let's say we we're talking about bending moment, how much the beam bends. Um, you can see there that in the first case, uh, we would end up with those two distributions being added together. Uh, and then the one on the right, depending on where it sits laterally, how many girders there are, how stiff the deck is, we could end up in a position where it loads some girders more than the case that we're talking about 
on the left. And I think that that's, and, and in that example, this is a fictitious example, it's just trying to make the point. But what's important is that we haven't even considered live load factors, dynamic load allowances and, and associated lane factors at this stage. So again, the point that I'm trying to make here is that, you know, uh, 50 tonnes is not 50 tonnes when we're talking about a bridge, you know. Um, we can't just go, well, those two vehicles are 100 tonnes and the vehicle on the right is 100 tonnes, therefore, ah, it should be fine, you'll be right to go. It's more complicated than that. I don't want you to get too worried about all the specifics of how that comes together because we're going to cover that in the other webinars. And what I'm going to try and do is break it down to be a fairly simple process um, rather than, you know, having to know every little ins and outs. But uh, starting to understand some of these things is an important stepping stone. And we're really just at the start of the journey for many people. Some people already know this like the back of their hand, but, um, you know, it's a it's a process. So uh, I've already covered those lateral position, ground contact with bridge family is very important. So by that, I mean, you know, what's the type of superstructure that we're talking about? You know, here we've got some steel I-beams, but, you know, a deck unit bridge or, a, you know, a concrete plank bridge, something like that will have quite a different um, uh, outcome. So. There's this concept of what is bridge capability that I just wanted to touch on. This will be very important as we go through this process, um, but I just want to start to introduce this idea of bridge capability. And, and essentially what I'd like you to think about is that it could be defined as the biggest vehicle that you know can safely cross the structure. And, and why is it important to start to get an understanding of what our bridge capability is? Well, it's important because that's the building blocks of how you start to compare those vehicles to vehicles that apply for access. And we will do that with a process of something called T1 assessment and using the assessment frameworks to do that. But essentially, that's what we're talking about. What's the biggest vehicle that you know can safely cross the structure? And I'd just like to pose this uh, question initially. Can you compare gross vehicle mass only? Now, hopefully from what we've gone through today, in your mind, you should very clearly now get the point that you cannot compare gross vehicle mass only. We need to consider a whole range of variables and we will frame that hopefully in a very clear way over the next three uh, webinars. So obviously we need to consider axle loadings, axle spacings, bridge configuration, span and continuity, ground contact width and transverse position, live load factors, associated lane factors, right? We'll define this and particularly bridge capability as we get to it. So I know that's a bit of a whirlwind and most uh, some people would feel a little bit overwhelmed uh, with with what I've gone through. We don't all need to become experts in, in bridge engineering, but what we need to do is get to the point where we start to understand that some things matter and some things don't. And just recapping the main points of what I talked about and the key things that I really want you to take away from today, the really the critical parameter with the loading of structures um, with, with vehicles is that the axle loadings matter the, and the axle spacings mass. So that is the um, concentration of mass. Also the bridge configuration matters. So that's the span and the continuity. So continuity, whether we have, you know, that, that fixed nature across piers or whether they are separate, the, the, the decks on each side and the, and the girders on each side are separate so that they can actually, um, yeah, they don't interact with each other. That's important. And the ground contact width, how wide the vehicle is, and the transverse position of those vehicles on the bridge also um, matters. And we'll talk about that in upcoming webinars. The live load factor is there to allow for the chance of overloading, and that's all it's designed to do. It's not designed to account for there being a vehicle next to it uh, or anything like that. It's not designed to account for dynamic loads or anything like that. It is only to account for the chance that uh the the whatever's on that vehicle is much heavier than what it's meant to be 
uh, and that's what the live load factor is meant to be. And that, you know, these potentially, the live load factors could be modified if we had more certainty around the, what those live load factors, uh, if, if we had more certainty around what the, 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 uh, the potential for those vehicles to be overloaded is. So the dynamic load allowance, uh, what that accounts for is the dynamic amplification of the static loads, uh, um, and that leads to you know an increase overall increase in loads. Um, that's what that's designed to account for, and it's around forty percent uh, usually at the moment. But obviously, in some situations where the vehicle speed is really reduced, that could be as low as ten percent, uh, or um, if you have a very smooth profile and you can guarantee you have a smooth profile, there is some opportunity to reduce those loads. And the last point that I just wanted to make here, and I'll, I'll cover this in more detail in other uh, webinars, but when we're thinking about the bridge capability, what we're talking about is what is the biggest vehicle that can cross the bridge? But when we're deciding that, we must consider multiple presence of vehicles, right? And when we do that, we use things like associated lane factors um, to help determine that. And we need to be thinking about ground contact widths and lateral positions of vehicles when we do that. But that's a really important point, And it's something that could be quite confusing as we move forward. Um, because uh, when we get to it, we'll realize that when we do tier one assessment, we're not considering associated lane vehicles in that specific comparison assessment. But we will have considered that if we go through the process correctly, right? But when we are actually deciding what is the biggest vehicle that we feel that we can have cross a structure, we must consider multiple presence of vehicles if there are lanes for other vehicles to be in. So hopefully that, uh, you know, sort of emphasizes the key points that I uh, wanted to go through. Part of what is important in what I've discussed is that you'll see that there's lots of factors in here to account for the chance of overloading, for the chance of dynamic interaction, for the chance of vehicles being next to each other. So that when you get an assessment result uh, outcome, either you've done that yourself or you've got a supplier or a consultant to do that for you, if the result comes back as lower, you know, a substandard result, you know, so that they say, well, that load is too high for that structure. What is very important to realise is it doesn't mean that a vehicle of the um, the mass that's been assessed would fail a structure. It doesn't fail the structure because the actual load of that vehicle is much lower. We have lots of factors to um, give us some safety. And, and so that's really important because within that safety, we might have opportunities to control the risk and get better um, outcomes with what may be, uh, you know, sort of substandard bridge stock. So just something to keep in mind, just before, because your assessment ratio is 0.99, doesn't mean that you're in imminent risk of danger. Uh, it means that your uh, safety margins are slightly reduced from what is ideal. And I think that's an important way to think about these things because uh, we can get quite cut and dry in our mind. No, it's the assessment ratio came back just under what it's meant to be. Therefore, that vehicle cannot travel. And I think the reality is, is that just the safety margin has been re reduced by a tiny amount. Um, maybe uh, we need to be starting to think about that. Um, and that's why I raised that particular point. All right. so. I've gone two minutes over and uh, we'll get to some questions. Just a, a quick uh, comment. Uh, obviously, uh, some further training opportunities. Go and have a look at that. I've got these upcoming webinars as well. And we're also working on some other programs. So we had some comments about, you know, uh, training in other states. We are trying to work on some of those things. So um, we'll keep you posted on that. Well, Todd. You've been watching the, uh, the the chat, hopefully. Maybe you could uh, tell me some questions that have been asked. Yeah, thanks, Neil. Um, and that's great. I think uh, you've covered off some important concepts there, so hopefully people are quite informed by that. But I think in, importantly, the point you made at the end around, you know, in a practical sense, 
um, you know, what does it actually mean? And there's plenty of plenty of uh, capacity built into our structures. So we're not necessarily uh, in a position where we need to panic about this, but we do need to consider all those different interactions as we go through. So I think that's really informative. Thanks, Neil. All right, um, so we'll just have a look now. We've got a few questions that have come up. So I'll just go back to the top here. Um, so we've got Chung, uh, he said major concern on quad axle vehicles of 27 ton, uh, more information analysis on axle spacings too. So any comments on that, Neil? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, it's interesting, uh, the, the, the quad axle, um, I know that people can be quite panicked by it because it, because it says that it's 27 tonnes, but um, I, I will come back to that same statement that I, I made earlier. Um, well, it, does it, is it of concern? Does it matter? Well, it depends. That's always the answer, right? <laughs> so, you know, what is the context, right? So for some structures that, that may be worse, but what you have to realise is that now 27 tonnes is spread over four axles and not three. So, you know, we, we have a situation where we had 22 uh, in, and a half tonnes on a HML triaxle. Well, when we go to 27 tonnes on a quad axle, that's actually a lower load per axle and it's spread out over a longer distance. But there's no denying that it is overall a higher mass. Um, so, you know, the answer to that really comes down to, well, it depends. And through these webinars, we will show you the tools that will allow you to make that comparison. And the comparison is, uh, you know, is a fairly foolproof way to actually see whether the impacts of that load would be higher or less than vehicles that you've already allowed across the structure. And that's the fundamentals of tier one assessment. And, uh, you know, we will show you uh, the tools and how to use those. And that hopefully will address that question because we shouldn't be thinking about, oh, 27 tonnes sounds heavy. We should use our, our tools and our science and our engineering to decide whether it actually has an impact or not. Um, and that's a key thing that we're trying to do through this uh, webinar series. Um Chung goes on to say uh, another concern is the age of bridge structures, which I think we can all we can all agree on there. Um, yeah. uh, quite a lot of the bridge stock is is 20, 30 or even more years old. So that's certainly a concern. And then within that, uh, Chung also makes the comment around the bridge bearings. So different components within the bridge itself. Yeah, I, I think this is a, a really important point uh, that, you know, as bridges get older, they have the potential to deteriorate. Um, and, and so that's why it's it's absolutely vitally important. And I made this point in the last webinar that you must do condition assessments in the process of deciding uh, heavy vehicle access requests. You must have up-to-date uh, level two um, bridge inspections uh, completed. And, and those need to look at the condition of those elements. And if there is concern of deterioration of those elements, you need to get that assessed as to whether they can appropriately carry the load. Now that is, is definitely gets into the domain of the structural engineer and professional engineering advice, um, but you need to go through those processes of identifying, you know, whether something has deteriorated. And, and I would suggest that nearly everyone has the capability really to see that you know something doesn't look so good. Um, if I if I use the old adage that uh, they often use in first aid training, uh, if it looks crook, it is crook, right? So if someone looks sick, they're sick, right? It's the same with your bridges. If you go look at a component and you go, oh, geez, that doesn't look right, it's probably not right, and you need to get it checked out. So um, I think that's a you know a, a a good way to think about these things. And as you said in that last uh, webinar, Neil, the importance of undertaking um, inspections, particularly the level two inspections on a regular basis, particularly for those higher risk um, structures that you might have within your area. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, now, just on that theme around the age of bridge structures, uh, Grant has gone on to say um, that's a primary concern, very hard to look at old structures and have confidence in original calculations and less confidence in current day estimates. So that's a, a, a further valid point in terms of what you were just saying there, Neil. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's right. And I think that um, confidence in the original calculations, um, yeah, perhaps is uh, is a concern. And in those situations, potentially you do have the options of doing uh, more detailed assessment with something that we call tier two assessment, which we will come to, or tier three. Uh, again, we'll come to that in coming weeks. Um, yeah, and that's that's definitely important. But something that is worth thinking about in terms of that is also thinking about what the performance has been historically, right? So we might be concerned that, oh, well, this was done to a code in the 50s, you know, so we're worried about that, right? Go look at your structure. You know, is it showing signs of distress? You know, what sort of loads are currently travelling across it, right? There will be situations where when we're trying to define our bridge capability, we're not going to be able to get the level of detail on, you know, what that load is by doing very complex, detailed tier two assessments, right? It's just not viable to do that for our whole bridge stock because it's quite expensive. So we are going to have to get to a position where we go, well, what's a fair guess at this? And the current performance of the structures and what's currently on it is a pretty good place to start. Uh, I think, and and that's something that we need to think about. Now, being less confident in current day estimates, uh, I, I can understand potentially where you're coming from, and that is a worry. Um, but uh, but it, it's something that uh, you know we need to be thinking about in terms of the quality of the information that we're getting from our suppliers. You know, do we need second opinions? Does that match what we're actually seeing? You know, all of that stuff. Yeah, it really matters. So again, I mean, further to the point, talking about older structures, I guess it reinforces why it's so much more important to understand what the condition of the structure is. Absolutely. Because in a lot of ways, you know, it, when you know what the condition of the structure is, the age to some extent becomes less of an issue because yep. you know where it's at in relation to what was that original design. Yep. Um, yeah, definitely. But, Thanks, Grant. Um, what else have we got here? So, Anthony, are we ever are we ever going to cover loads on bridges where the road has a radius, i.e., the bridge is part of a curve? I think you might have touched on this slightly earlier on in the in this webinar, Neil. Oh, I didn't. I didn't. Uh, you're talking about. I think they're talking about horizontal curve there. Um, you know, going around the corner, which I I didn't cover. I think so. Um. There can be some specialist considerations in that in those situations, but generally, <clears throat> uh, the tier one assessment that I'll go through, you know, while that hasn't specifically been looked at in terms of validity, I would be very confident that it would still be valid. What's important is that the underlying assessment we'll get to what that means, but a tier two assessment or the original design has been done in an appropriate way. And if that's been done in an appropriate way, I would be very confident that tier one assessment will get us to where we need to get to. But I think it's a very important point that we need to consider the limitations um, and that might be something a bit specialised that we would need to look at in, uh, in more detail. Um, I guess. So, you know, a lot of this, the, the basic process that we will talk about in this webinar series, you know, it's going to be suitable for, you know, 95 or 99 percent of the bridge talk. There's always going to be some that you're going, oh, I don't know. Oh, well, you know, maybe you need to look at that in a different way. Yeah. Um, and Graham has asked, um, it's a good question. How do you look at the comparison between concrete and timber structures and I suppose further to the point steel structures as well yeah that's uh that's that's very uh interesting and, and I think that the important point is that you know generally we won't compare concrete timber and steel you know when we're doing the sorts of assessment processes that we will look at um through this uh through this webinar series we're not comparing different material types you know we find appropriate um vehicles that represent the bridge capability for an individual bridge and then we use that to then make access decisions uh, and so uh, we're not looking at comparisons but I, I would make the comment that obviously these structures do perform and behave in different ways like for instance if we talk about a timber structure the lateral distribution of load doesn't transfer as well through those structures right 
um, uh, you know, a Nazra Iger to beam, you know, we get transfer, but it's not as significant as a, a, a transversely stressed deck unit or a slab bridge. So that's why bridge families do really matter in this whole situation. Um, but that direct comparison is not something that we would be uh, doing as part of this, uh, this process. Thanks, Neil. Um, Raja has asked um, on bridge structures, which are one lane in each direction, for heavy loads traveling on center of the bridge is the safest option. Yeah, well, certainly, uh, you know, if you've got a heavy load traveling down the center of the bridge, you in many situations, you will have the potential for that load to be higher than if, you know, you have a, uh, you know, the traffic open on in both directions. Um, the, a couple of comments that I'd make around that is that what, what's important is that, you know, when you are making access decisions that, you know, provisions that are made are things that are achievable by the operator and that also don't ask them to break the law in any way. So, you know, if you've got a road with a, you know, a, a bridge with a double line down the centre, and you've said an operator, you've got to travel down the centre of the road, but they're just travelling in open traffic conditions. Well, I'd suggest that's probably not an appropriate condition to have placed because you're asking them to break the law, crossing double lines. But in that situation, you know, you could use other measures like, you know, using a, uh, a pilot and traffic control to close the bridge to traffic while that load goes across the bridge, um, get them to travel in a particular position. So there are ways to manage um, access and get better access outcomes, um, but we just need to be very mindful of what we are asking operators to do and also be mindful of the level of compliance that um, is likely. For instance, you know, if, if you have a dual lane bridge on a major highway and, and you tell uh, uh, an operator you must travel in the right hand lane, but the exit that they need to get to is literally 500 metres down the road from that point, well, it's probably quite unlikely that you're going to get the level of compliance that you're expecting um, and they'll just run wherever they run. So these are just a few points that we need to be considering. Um, but yes, yeah, certainly center lane uh, travel is is a way that we can maximize our um, assessment outcomes and, and access outcomes, I guess. So we've got a few more comments just around the age of structures here, and I think um, one here that Vikram has mentioned, we've got a bridge that was constructed in 1922 um, as level condition, uh, level two condition rating um, is three or is that minus three? I'm not sure. Three. Uh, but they don't they don't have the construction drawing. So the question is about, well, how do you do an assessment in those cases? And clearly this is quite a, a complex one, but the point around the construction drawings is something Neil, that we've encountered quite a bit in this program when we've been looking to undertake assessments. Yeah, absolutely. It's 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 one of the real critical elements, and and I would encourage everyone to think about drawings as being your absolute gold elixir that you need to make sure that you lock away in your vault, um, and that you know if ever you're going through a consolidation exercise, you don't do poor quality scans and just chuck them into a file and go, oh yeah, we did that. Um, that information that's on those drawings is absolutely critical to the ongoing management of an asset. And we need to really consider that. I mean, we still see instances where structures that are relatively um, new, you know, less than a decade old, and people don't have drawings for them. You know, this is something that we have to really shoot to the top of the prioritisation list in terms of, you know, making sure that we keep this information. Now, having said that, obviously, you know, we're, we're often in situations where we don't have this information. So um, it, it's a, uh, you know, when we're talking about a structure that is condition rating of three, that obviously means that there is concerns. You know, when I talk about condition ratings, what a three means to me is that we need to do something uh, soon versus a four, which is we need to do something now. So it means that there is some significant defects that need to be actioned uh, sometime in the near future. Now. What that means for the uh, assessment outcomes or access decision making is that we need to get a handle on what that condition uh, state three actually means for our load carrying capacity of the structure. So that's a pretty um, 
that, that's not something if you don't have the background in you know structural engineering you're not going to be able to answer that so you really need to go and get some advice on does this defect affect the load carrying capacity because just because you've got a condition state three um uh, element doesn't mean it's necessarily affected the load carrying capacity it depends like everything it depends on the context and depends where it is and and what that is if that condition state three is because of a a, a crack that's greater than you know 0.3 millimeters and it's a vertical crack in an abutment well it probably doesn't make any difference maybe it's in a wing wall makes no difference you know but if that's a 0.3 millimeter crack at mid span or it's a 0.3 millimeter crack in the sh critical shear region of a beam well that matters a great deal more you know um, and so you need to get some specialist advice there in, in terms of the the, the structures being uh, you know from 1922 the, the critical issue there is that you're not really going to be able to get any historical idea of what it was designed for right so you know your options without drawings and stuff become quite limited in terms of developing what your bridge capability is so in this instance what you need to start thinking about well what is your historical access been and maybe trying to set a bench line from current proven performance um, something along the line those lines there there are other options potentially but i won't get into those at the moment but um i, I guess there there's some comments around that i guess yeah, so quite quite complex situations that, that you're talking about there. So obviously difficult to to uh, to come up with an answer. Hopefully in the upcoming webinars, as you were saying, Neil, we're going to talk about how to deal with the majority of situations. And as you say, there'll always be those special special circumstances outside of that where we might need to call in some expertise to help out um, in getting that understanding. Mm -hmm. So that's all the questions. Thanks everyone um, for your participation. Uh, today and and for asking those really good questions um, and thanks to Neil for covering off on the very important topic around basic vehicle and bridge interactions today it's been really good all right so um, now um, in relation to the webinars uh, remaining in this series this is number two there's obviously another six more um, you can register for all of those now um, so that the link is available to you um, we can go through and um, and register for those over the coming weeks. And we've tried to break that up so there's two each week and we don't take up too much of your time at any any one day. So, um, so thank you again for your attendance today and we look forward to seeing you in the next webinar um, next Tuesday. Thanks very much. See Thanks you later. Everyone. Thank you.